Good morning and good afternoon. Welcome to another episode of Before Coffee. It is mucking fun day here on the, is this the second or third week of March? I don't know. Time's relative. Second. And good morning to all those people in the U.S. who have just changed their clocks and you lost an hour, right? You lost an hour of sleep. And that's why it's National Napping Day. Let's go ahead and get into our headlines. Today on Before Coffee. Two short news stories, Swedish Parliament protest, and the altered photos of the Princess of Wales. And U.S. forces have, are flying to Haiti to uh, help evacuate non-essential personnel. Five things to know about Russia's upcoming presidential election. And America wondered what happened to winter. And we talk about Katie Britt and her big lies. In culture news, let's talk about the Oscars 2024 and Oppenheimer's big sweep. No stories and more, which is National Napping Day, my favorite day. March 11th, 2024 on Before Coffee. All right, let's go into our first news stories of Monday. It is about Greta Thunberg blocking the entrance of Swedish Parliament with a bunch of other people. I'm sure it wasn't just her by herself. This is from the Canadian press. A group of climate activists on Monday blocked, which is today, blocked the entrance of Swedish Parliament advocating for sweeping reforms to tackle climate disasters. Some 40 activates and activists, including Greta Thunberg, held signs reading Climate Justice Now as they sat in front of at least two entrances in the 349-seat Reichstag, including the main doorway. Swedish media said lawmakers used other entries into the assembly. The climate justice movement has, for decades, been repeating the same message over and over again like a broken record. We feel like we are not being heard, Thunberg told the Associated Press. Climate protesters have accused fossil fuel companies of deliberately slowing the global energy transition to renewables in order to make a profit. Thunberg 21 has inspired global youth movements demanding stronger efforts to fight climate change after staging weekly protests, protests outside the Swedish parliament starting in 2018. She repeatedly has been fined in Sweden and the UK for disobedience, which is really funny that they fine you for that, to law enforcement in connection with protests. Earlier this year, she was acquitted on a charge of refusing to follow a police order to leave a protest blocking the entrance to a major oil and gas industry conference in London. The judge cited significant deficiencies in evidence. So she's still going strong, as we all should be when it comes to climate change, because, I mean, as we're about to talk about soon, where what happened to the winter? I wonder. Mystery, huh? In some kind of celebrity drama news, several leading organizations, this is from Reuters, withdrew a picture of Kate, 42, posing with her three children after post-publication analysis showed it did not meet their editorial standards. Like many amateur photo photographers, I do occasionally experiment with editing. The message on Twitter from Kate said, um, Kate, Britain's, prin Britain's Princess of Wales, issued an apology on social media on Monday for an, any confusion caused by an edited photograph which had been issued by her office, Kensington Palace, the previous day. Several leading news organizations, including Reuters, withdrew the picture of Kate 42 posing with her three children after the post-publication analysis showed it did not meet their standards. In the picture, a smiling Kate 42 was shown posing with her beaming children, Princess Princess george and louis and princess charlotte in windsor where the family live kensington palace said the photo had been taken by her husband heir to the throne prince william last week news agency including getty reuters and the associate press and afp and the press association later withdrew the photograph reuters pictures editor said part of the sleeve of kate's daughter's cardigan did not line up properly suggesting that the image had been altered a royal sister said quit had wanted to post an informal picture of her family to mark mother's day which was celebrated in Britain on Sunday, and had mi made minor adjustments. The picture had already affected the huge media attention as it was the first official photograph of Kate since she spent two weeks in the hospital after un undergoing abdominal surgery in January for a non-cancerous but unspecified condition. 
Although her office said she will not return to public duties until after Easter and she was recovering well, her absence has led to intense speculation about her health on social media in recent weeks. Yes, um, I people have thought she's been dead this whole time and that they're using her as like a, you know, because of AI, right? You can just make her again and a photo. She's not dead. Some people are like, oh yeah, she has cancer and she's and currently bedridden for the rest of her life or she has pancreatic cancer. Like, the conspiracy theories are just going all over the place when it comes to this just because she edited a photo which has been happening for many many years not just recently right <laughs> but AI, i guess ai is pushing people over into paranoia when it comes to is this real i don't know if this is real ah something one wrong thing is altered about this photo it must be fake you know that's kind of where we are when thanks to ai that's kind of where we are now if one thing is altered like oh i made my my waist a little thinner <gasps> That's AI. That's not even a real person. <laughs> it's like, there's a difference, but there's your two kind of news briefs, I guess, for Monday. Another way we can. Another way we can use denial. Uh, yeah. <laughs> one of our favorite. One of our favorite drugs. Okay. All right. So, in international intrigue and news, uh, the United States is. Uh, evacuating a non-essential forces people sorry forces from people from haiti if you got to be in haiti and you don't have to be there you probably should always get out it's a very very dangerous place this is uh ebbes salon from associated press street battles between anti-government gangs and police have crippled haiti's fragile economy the united nations officials saying half of the country's more than 11 million inhabitants don't have enough to eat and 1.4 million are starving. U.S. military says Sunday that it flown in forces to beef up security at the U.S. Embassy in Haiti and allow non-essential personnel to leave. The aircraft flew to the embassy compound, the U.S. Southern Command said, meaning that the effort involved helicopters. It was careful to point out that no Haitians were on board the military aircraft that seemed aimed at quashing any speculation that the senior government officials might be leaving as the gang attacks in Haiti worsened. The neighborhood around the embassy in capital Port-au-Prince is largely controlled by gangs. The airlift personnel in and out of the embassies it is consistent with our standard practices for embassy security augmentation worldwide and no Haitians were on board the military aircraft according to this Southcom command statement. In many state, in many cases, non-essential personnel can handle the families of diplomats, but the embassy had already ordered departure of non-essential staff and all family members in July. The personnel buried out to, of the embassy may have simply been rotating out to be refreshed by new staff. The statement Sunday said that the United States remains focused on aiding Haitian police and arranging some kind of UN authorized security deployment, but those efforts have been unsuccessful so far. Haiti's embattled Prime Minister Ariel Henry traveled recently to Kenya and pushed for UN backed deployment of a police force from the East African country to fight fight the gangs, but a Kenyan court ruled on January that such a deployment would be unconstitutional. Henry, who is facing calls to resign or form a transitional council, remains unable to return home. He arrived in Puerto Rico on Tuesday after he was unable to land in the Dominican Republic, which borders Haiti. On Saturday, the office of Dominican President Luis Ab Abinader issued a statement saying that Henry is not welcome in the Dominican Republic for safety reasons. Dominican Republic, which shares the island of Hispaniola with Haiti, has closed its land border. Given the current situation, the presence of Haitian Prime Minister in the Dominican Republic is not considered appropriate, according to the statement, adding, this decision reflects the firm position of the Dominican Republic government to safeguard its national security and stability. The statement described the security situation in Haiti as totally unsustainable and said, that it poses a direct threat to the safety and stability of the Dominican Republic. The statement predicted that the situation could deteriorate even further if the peacekeeping force is not implemented urgently to restore order. Caribbean leaders have recalled, have called for an emergency meeting on Monday in Jamaica on what they called Haiti's dire situation. They invited the United States, France, Canada, United Nations, and Brazil to the meeting. Members of the CARICOM 
regional trade bloc have been trying for months to get political actors in Haiti to agree to form an umbrella of transitional unity government. Eric Scom said Friday that while regional leaders remain deeply engaged in trying into in trying to bring opposition parties and civil society groups together to form a unity government, the stakeholders are not where they need to be. Unrelenting gang attacks have paralyzed the country for more than a week and left it dwindling supplies of basic goods. Asian officials extended state, emer state of emergency and, right and nightly curfew on Thursday as gang continues to attack key state institutions. But average Haitians, many of whom have been forced from their homes by the bloody street fighting can't wait. The problem for police in securing the government buildings that many Haitians have streamed into them, seeking refuge. We are the ones who pay the taxes, We are, and we need to have shelter, said one woman who didn't give her name for safety reasons. Another Port-au-Prince resident who also did not give his name described Friday's attacks. They, the gangs, came, up, came with big guns. We have no guns and we cannot defend ourselves. All of us, the children are suffering, said the man. There's the latest horrible crap going on in Haiti. Speaking of horrible, uh, Friday's show did not come up on YouTube. Are we still getting blocked? Can you just take the video down yes. at the end? Can't use music as the mic drop. I keep telling you, you that. Just take it off and just issue it. <laughs> you can get my Weird Al video you can put up instead. I don't know. What? That's it. That's not my story. I'm okay. done talking, so. Yeah, I was uh, wondering. It, I don't know. You just started talking about something random in the just, middle there. All right. No, I was, I was talking about what happened Friday's story. I just well, haven't seen For it. our next story, we're going to talk about Russia's upcoming presidential election. This is from France 24. Okay. It's by somebody, but they're, you. the title of the person isn't here. Oh, no. It's just by France 24. Okay. Russian President Vladimir Putin is seeking a fifth term as Russians vote for Friday, from Friday to Sunday, an election that has already raised transparency and accountability concerns. No kidding, it's Russian election time. After two anti-war candidates were disqualified and the remaining three have all been supported by the Russian invasion of Ukraine, Russia is holding a presidential election that is set to hand President Vladimir Putin another six-year mandate despite the upheaval triggered by Moscow's war in Ukraine. After a 2021 constitutional reform altered Russia's term limits, Putin could remain in power until 2036. He was first elected president in 2000. The Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe has said its election observers were not invited to monitor the 2024 vote to ensure impartial and in independent assessment of the electoral process. Here are five things to know about the Russian election. No anti-war opposition. The only would-be candidates opposed to the campaign in Ukraine, Boris Nadezhdin and Yakaterina Dunsova, who gathered tens of thousands of signatures to support their candidacies, had their applications turned down. Mm. Other than Putin, there are three registered candidates, the National Conservative Leonid Slutsky, Slutsky, lovely, the Communist Party candidate Nikolai Karitonov, and Vladislav Davankov, a businessman. They have all supported Russia's war in Ukraine. Kremlin critics point out that the role of these three candidates is to channel and dis any discontent and give a pluralist varnish to the vote at a time when the opposition has been greatly diminished by repression. Independent observers also say that the authorities have means at their disposal to manage the results, including vote rigging, ballot stuffing, and using millions of state employees to back the status quo. The only known unknown factors is whether there could be any protests, as called by the late opposition leader Alex Alexei Navalny and now his widow Yulia Navalny. Navalny. Thousands of supporters turned out to pay their respects to Navalny's funeral in Moscow last month, some chanting anti-government slogans. His widow has called the election a complete fiction and fake, and earlier this month urged supporters to show up at the polling stations on Sunday to protest. 
What to do next? The choice is yours. You can vote for any candidate except Putin, she said in a YouTube video. You can ruin the ballot. You can ru write Navalny in big letters on it. And if you don't see the point in voting at all, you can just come and stand at the polling stations and then turn around and go home. Putin's promises. While the result of the election is, no doubt, the government is campaigning hard in a bid to strengthen Putin's domestic and international legitimacy. The Kremlin chief is in a better position now because of Russian advances to Ukraine amid crackdowns in Western support for Kiev and the Russian econ economy proving resilient despite heavy sanctions. Putin has stepped up media appearances in recent weeks, meeting students, visiting factories, and even taking a flight in a nuclear bomber. But the efforts have not come without a cost. According to inter internal Kremlin documents recently obtained by the Estonian news website Delphi, the government has spent some 1 billion euros on propaganda ahead of the elections. However, the Russian president has never taken part in an election debate since coming into power nearly a quarter in a of a century ago and will not start now. In a State of Nation speech last month, he made a long series of budget promises, handing out billions of rubles to modernize schools and infrastructure, fight poverty and protect the environment and boost technology. The speech laid out a program of governance until at least 2030. If, even though the economy has held up far better than expected, many Russians are worried about rising prices, particularly for food and in general, the instability generated by the war in Ukraine. Labor shortages have piled up since thousands of young men have either died or are fighting in Ukraine, while hundreds and thousands of other people have fled abroad because they oppose the conflict or to avoid military service. Like famously that one Russian who moved all the way to Mexico became a truck driver just to avoid service. The authorities have clamped down hard in recent months on demonstrations by the wives of conscripted soldiers who have been asking for their loved ones to be allowed to return from the front. Calls to vote. Patriotic posters have been plastered around the country calling on Russians to vote. The election posters have a V sign akin to the use by Russian troops in Ukraine and the slogan, Together we are strong. Let's vote for Russia. The authorities will also organize raffles and entertainment to encourage voters to come out and vote in a country where disenchantment with politics, particularly among young people, is high because Putin will win anyways, so why vote? I can see why they feel that way. Neighboring Ukraine and its Western allies are presented as troublemakers in state media and official speeches. speeches. Putin warned in December about possible foreign interference in the vote and promised a severe response. Last week, Russia summoned the US Ambassador Lion Tracy, accusing US-funded NGOs of spreading disinformation about the election. According to Moscow Times, Russia warned of real aleatory measures that could include expelling U.S. embassy officials involved in such actions. In a sign of Russian authorities trying to protect normality and ongoing conflict, there will be voting in Russia held areas of Ukraine. Russia in 2022 declared the unilateral annexation of four regions of Ukraine, even though its troops still do not contort control them fully. Kyiv said local inhabitants are now being subjected to threats and violence to force them to vote something which Moscow denies. Russian soldiers deployed in Ukraine have been able to cast their ballots early. Three women sit on a bench near a mobile polling station during early voting in Russia's presidential election in Donetsk, Russian-controlled Ukraine, on March 10, 2024. Eve warned that residents in Russian annexed areas have been threatened against not voting. Either vote or you will die. Or something like that. We'll put you in prison if you don't vote. You are a Russian citizen now, so you must vote. Either way, that's all you need to know about the upcoming election. I'm going to be biased here and say the election for president of Russia has never, ever been what I would consider democracy. It's just put a paper in there and it doesn't matter because they've already decided who's won because he has all the power. It's a... Sorry, what do you say? I wasn't. I wasn't. I wasn't actually in Russia, so I can't say for sure. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeltsin, back in the nineties. Yeah. Well, that's my story. All right, and in the U.S., uh, which is probably the case with much of the world, the weather. What the hell? 
I mean, I'm not glorifying the great weather because it rains all the time in Maryland and it's windy again. But what happened in the winter? This is Associated Press. Uh, Seth Borenstein. Watch of America asks, where did winter go? Spring starts early as U.S. winter was warmest on record. Across America, much of America, especially in normally chilly north, the country went through the winter months without, well, winter. In Parker Strongholds, Burlington, Vermont, and Portland, Maine, the thermometer never plunged below zero. The state of Minnesota called the last three months a lost winter. Warmer than its infamous year without a winter, 1877-1878. Michigan, where mosquitoes were biting in February, offered disaster loans to businesses hit by lack of snow. The Great Lakes set records for low winter ice, with Erie and Ontario essentially ice-free. For a wide swath of the country, from Colorado to New Jersey and Texas to the Carolinas, spring leaves are arriving. I, I, for, for me, the frogs have been singing since uh, basically February. So early February. According to the National Phenology Network, which tracks the timing of plants, insects, and other natural signs of the seasons. Long-term warning combined with El... Long-term warming, sorry. Combined with El Nino conspired to make winter not show up in the U.S. this year, said Yale Climate Connection meteorologist Jeff Masters, who co-founded a private firm, Weather Underground. Masters said he was bitten by a mosquito in Michigan this year, which he called crazy. On Friday, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration confirmed that the winter of 2023-24 was the warmest in nearly 130 years of record keeping in the United States. The lower 48 averaged 37 degrees or 3.1 Celsius, which is 5.4 degrees above average. It's a big, big, or three degrees Celsius above average. That's a lot. That's just the latest of a drumbeat of broken temperature records. A national global scientist says mostly from human uh, caused climate change from the burning of coal, oil, and gas. It was the warmest U.S. bio winter by a wide margin. The past three months were 0.82 degrees warmer than the previous record set eight years ago, which is pretty good leap above the previous record, said Karen Gleason, chief of monitoring for NOAA's. Na National Centers for Environmental Information. Last month was only the third warmest February on record, but Iowa Beluga passed its warmest February by two degrees, while parts of Minnesota were 20 degrees warmer than average in February, Gleason said. So you get the gist of this. We're got us a hot, hot planet, and I don't think winter's gonna be very cool. It's gonna be a hot winter, probably with a lot of storms. And so yeah we'll try to enjoy it we'll try to we'll try to enjoy it between the raindrops and the 120 degree summer we're headed for and other news we didn't we covered the state of the union by joe biden last week we did not cover the gop response which was tragically funny and we'll say why tragically funny in a minute GOPs, this is from the Metal blog, msnbc.com, or M NBC, at msnbc.com. Written by Steve Bannon, even though it's the Maddow blog, she doesn't write her own blog. Either. For many Americans, the problem with Kent, Senator Katie, Katie Britt's response to the State of the Union address was obvious before it was even over. An advisor to Donald Trump, for example, asked during the Alabama Senator's remark, remarks, what the hell am I watching right now? Okay. It was not a common question. So many officials' State of the Union responses have been dreadful that some have been raised the possibility of a curse. But Brit's underwrought over sorry, Brit's overwrought delivery, wild tonal swings, and kitchen setting were unusually cringeworthy, drawing complaints from GOP officials and their allies. The fact that the Republican remarks were parodied on Saturday Night Live. Help drive home, home the obvious point. Britt's response failed. As a New York Times report summarized, with a sunny, inviting smile, Senator Katie Britt of Alabama welcomed Americans to her kitchen on Thursday night. Many soon backed away nervously. It wasn't long, however, before attention shifted away from the problem with the Senator's delivery toward the substantive problem with Britt's message itself. Early on, the Alabamans' remarks 
for Senator's remarks, she talked about having traveled to Texas, where she spoke to a woman who had raped and sex trafficked in Mexican cartels starting at the age of 12. Britt goes on to detail the woman's horrific experience of daily sexual assault. She concludes by saying, we wouldn't be okay with this happening in a third world country. This is the United States of America, and it's past time, in my opinion, that we start acting like it. President Biden's border policies are disgrace. Britt's phrasing fairly clearly implies that the woman's sexual abuse had taken place in the United States. But it didn't. The woman Britt referred to as Carla ja was Carla Jacinto Romero, who has survived the horrific nightmare that few can even imagine, who has become a prominent activist. The senator's office told NBC in a statement that the story from the State of the Union response was 100% true, but is also plainly misleading by omitting highly relevant details. The, abusive Romer the abuses Romero endured predated Biden's presidency by decades and Romero does not appear to have ever lived or sought asylum in the United States. She's never lived or sought asylum in the United States. Apparently, she's just visited, basically, and that's it. Viewers were obviously given a false impression of what happened and when. It, it led the Washington Post to publish a fact-check report that concluded in a high-profile speech like this, the politician, politician should not mislead voters with some emotionally charged language. Romero's story is tragic, and it may be evocative of other Mexican girls trapped in the sex trade in our country. But she was not trapped across the border and her story has nothing to do with Biden. Britt's failure to make that clear earns four Pinocchios. It has become frustratingly common for Republicans to blame Biden for developments that occurred during Donald Trump's term. But to blame Biden for something that happened under George W. Bush's term is even tougher to defend. In damage control mode, Britt appeared on Fox News Sunday and insisted that her carefully worded remarks did not mislead the public. After asked whether she intended to give her impression that sex trafficking in the question that happened during Biden's tenure, the GOP, law, law, GOP lawmaker responded, No! Oh, okay. You don't, have to, you don't have to straighten out the record. You just tell lies and leave it out there. It was difficult to answer or take seriously. The full transcript of the center's comments were readily available and it clearly shows Britt, who recently opposed bipartisan border reforms. Once again, she wants to complain about a problem, but she doesn't want to do anything about it. Punctuating the story about Romero by condemning President Biden's border crisis. Whether one approves or disapproves of the Democratic administration's policy, it had literally nothing to do with what happened to Romero. The sooner Britt acknowledges that she was wrong to imply otherwise, the better. There you go, another Republican lying. What a shock. I don't even know what to say anymore. We just gotta make things up. Yep. We can't come up with real issues. We gotta invent things that happened. Well, we didn't invent the thing that happened. We just tried to blame somebody else <laughs> for the problem. <laughs> that happened in another country. It's like saying, yeah. I can't believe, I can't believe George Washington didn't foresee the French Revolution. What was he doing? <laughs> why, why didn't he stop the French Revolution, George Washington? You know, back to you. Remember when Napoleon invaded the U.S.? No. What What are you talking about? <laughs> I can't believe he let... I can't believe Thomas Jefferson, of all people, didn't stop Napoleon. No. What are you thinking, Tom Jefferson? <laughs> all He's right. like... I don't care. It's in France. We can't do nothing about it. Oh, well, yeah, that's right. Actually, you don't I think run he Mexico. was friends with a lot of French people. But that's not the point. We're just I full of I don't think you can legitimately blame, blame the president of Mexico for that yeah. either. Because yeah. I don't know how you can blame anybody for that individual. These individuals acting badly. Individual crime, yeah. Anyway. All right. Yeah. For our culture news, this is coming out of Info Bay from Esther Palomino. Oscar 2024, Oppenheimer has won all the awards. No, I'm just kidding. They haven't won all the awards. And Poor Creatures, all the winning films. Oh, God, mm. what's happening? All right. I just want to be in read mode, but then it undid the read mode. Let me read no. mode. Yeah. I want to get another copy of Atlantic here. A night Regular. of party for the seventh art, the 2024 ceremony was held on Sunday, March 10th, and brought together the biggest figures in the industry. The annual gala organized by the Academy of Motion Picture, Picture Arts and Sciences was presented 
by Jimmy Kimmel and left several moments to remember. From the emotional victories like that of Divine Joy Randolph, Randolph for her role in Those Who Remain, to Oppenheimer's consecra consecrations to best film of the year. The event marked the closing of a great season for cinema. This is a count of the titles that achieved victories in Oscars on which platform OA. You can see the most valued Academy voters. Open Oppenheimer can be watched at Universal Pictures, I guess. A biographical film and written by Christopher Nolan. It takes the audience to a origin of a nuclear bomb. The origin of the nuclear bomb. Cillian Murphy plays the theatrical physicist J. Robert Oppenheimer, who takes the lead on Manhattan Project. The film not only shows what the character who takes the lead on the Manhattan Project about him, but also shows what the character experienced in Los Alamos and his political and personal dilemmas that he faced years later. It was the most nominated in the 96th edition of the Oscars and managed to win in seven categories. Best Film, Best Director for Nolan, Best Actor for Murphy, Best Editing, Best Supporting Actor for Robert Downey Jr., Best Photography, and Best Original Score. It's the entry into the... And it was uh, the only, I think, Best Director Oscar Nolan mm. ever won. Yeah. So he's been nominated, I think, a couple times, but this is the first time he's actually won a, an Oscar. And then we go to four things. Bella Baxter is an, ex an experiment that takes you on an adventure like no other. One of the most provocative works of last year's last year was Poor Things, which I just watched, I think, two weeks ago. It's a collaboration between Greek director Yorgos Lanthimos and versatile actress Emma Stone. The fiction is a surreal journey through the life of Bella Baxter, a woman who comes back to life after intervention of a scientist. Not exactly. Um, there's a pregnant woman dies and jumps off a bridge, and then her baby's brain is put into her body, so she does not come back Whoa. to life. Her baby was already alive and was just put in a grown woman's body, but that's the weird part about the film and it gets weirder from there. The film is described as an odyssey of self-discovery, empowerment, and sexual liberation. It received 11 nominations at the 2024 Oscars, of which won Best Actress, Best Makeup and Hairstyling, Best Product Duction Design, Best Costume Design. Then there is American Fiction. Backed by a 94% approval on Rotten Tomatoes, American Fiction took home a gold statuette for Best Adapted Screenplay. The film focuses on Thelonious Monk Ellison, Jeffrey Wright, an academic and writer who frustrated the criticism of his works, decides to write a satirical novel, My Pathology, which takes on the aim of the hypocrisy of the industry, editorial through reductionist archetypes about African-American culture. Contrary to ex expectations, the book becomes a success, confronting Ellison with the popula popularity of a work that he intended to be a reproach. Another great film was, of course, the Barbie film, one of the highest grossing releases of 2024. Its popularity not materializing in any trophies or awards. Director Greta Gerwig came with eight Oscar nominations, but only one recognition and Best Original Song category for the song What Was I Made For in the voice of Billie Eilish. You can see the fiction starring Margot Robbie and Ryan Gosling on Max. So here are the official winners of all the things. So get, get comfortable while I read this list. Best Film was Oppenheimer. Best Director, also Oppenheimer. Best Actress was Emma Stone in Poor Things. Best Actor was Cillian Murphy for Oppenheimer. Best Supporting Actor was Robert Downey Jr. for Oppenheimer. Supporting Actress was Devine Joy Rodolph from Those Who Stay. Best Song, What Was I Made For from Barbie by Billie Eilish. Best Original Score, Oppenheimer. Best Sound, The Zone of Interest. Best Fiction Short Film, The Wonderful Story of Henry Sugar. Best Cinematography, Oppenheimer. Best Documentary Film, 20 Days in Marpole. Best Documentary Short Film, The Last Repair Shop. Best Editing, Oppenheimer. Best Visual Effects, Godzilla, Minus One. Best International Film, The Zone of Interest. Best Costume Design, Poor Creatures. Best Production Design, Poor Creatures. Best Makeup and Hair, Poor Creatures. Best Adapted Film Screenplay, American Fiction. Best Original Screenplay, Anatomy of a Fall. Best Animated Film, The Boy and the Heron. 
which I think was, yeah, that was the most recent, uh, yeah. What is, well, I can't remember his name now. <laughs> Hayao Miyazaki <laughs> film. Hayao Miyazaki. Well, that was going to win. Easy. Right. He wins every, every, every time. And best anime short film was War's Over, inspired by the music of John and Yoko. Oh, I should watch that. That sounds fun. So there is all your Oscar winners. It was basically the two, to those two films and a couple of other ones. Anatomy of the Fall was definitely talked about before as being a really great film. So it bought, and then Zone of Interest won international. So check out those films. I've already watched them, so I don't have to check them out. I thought they were films. I did watch. They were Oscar bait films. I don't know what to tell you, you know? Oh, it's about a historical thing and it's about a really, weird thing like poor things was poor creatures was a very weird film very artistic sorry i knew it was going to win awards for that and i'm really disappointed that um the first native woman to ever get nominated did not win an oscar but hey Killer of next time and 50 years from now or something i was disappointed i watched part of it <clears throat> I, I was on it was on tv while i was doing dishes I was watching it. It was on. I was like, uh, and just like, uh, I don't want to see Oppenheimer now just because it won too many awards. <laughs> <laughs> it just, it just gave it every award, including soundtrack. That pissed me off because Robbie Robertson was up for uh, Killers of the Flower Moon. Yeah. The late Robbie Robertson. Who, I was like, yeah, Robbie Robertson can win. No, he didn't win. They gave it to Oppenheimer. I'm like Oppenheimer for there the soundtrack. There was music in that really? film. Yeah, I don't know. I was like, Z is all this. It was all this, you know, these soaring violins. Nolan and stuff, stuff like, yeah. I don't, I, like... I, don't, I, I don't know what it takes to write a music soundtrack for a movie. But I feel like Robbie Robertson should have got the Lifetime Achievement Award after he was dead. I'm just sorry. He wrote I so mean, many movie scores. Even if, even, even if you don't include that, right? Barbie had one. like a huge song based musical section right and that didn't win best score either right it's just like atmospheric blurring sounds one best score is just yeah well it's just when they play the blurb of the yeah. soundtrack robbie robertson's was the coolest it had drums in it and stuff you know <laughs> there actual, actual music. music wasn't just dee -dee 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 -dee, soaring for the sky music you know Ooh, we're bigger than god because we can make this soaring music i don't like those soundtracks they make me want to it just seems so ordinary. It just seems like average music that anybody could write. Like I could just get AI for s soundtrack music and just do it and it'll be over. Yeah. This day in history, bad segue, this day in history, <laughs> British general, well, let's, let's do this, make sure it's the right day. Okay. In 1544, Paquato Tasso, the greatest Italian poet of the late Renaissance, was born in Sorrento in the Kingdom of Naples. In 1811, in, North, in Arnold Nottingham, Nottingham, textile workers staged the first major Luddy riot in England, breaking the machinery that was causing their displacement and protest launched a movement that spread throughout the country massive wildcat strike it sounds like 1888 it's 1888 a winter storm began in the atlantic coast the united states ultimately blanking new york city with 22 inches of snow in other areas up to 50 inches the great blizzard of 1888 as it became known killed more than 400 people and caused widespread property damage a little warning to everybody winter is not actually over this could still happen British politician Harold Wilson, who led the Labour Party to victory in four general elections, who was Prime Minister of the United Kingdom from 1964 to 1970, and from 1974 to 1976, was born. So there's the answer to the question, was the United Kingdom ever led by the Labour Party? Well, Harold Wilson did it for quite a while. Four general elections. He's also prominently featured in that song, uh, Taxman, by uh, the Beatles. And, of course, to be fair, they also mentioned Edward Heath, who was the conservative leader at the time. You know, tax man, Mr. Wilson, and then tax man, Mr. Heath, at the end, right? Anyway, that's in the chorus. George Harrison doesn't say it, it's the 
Paul and George. I probably just Paul, Paul and John. I'm sorry. Anyway, happy birthday to Harold Wilson. 1918, one of the most devastating pandemics in human history reached the United States as the country reported its first cases of Spanish flu. 1926, an African-American civil rights leader, Ralph David Abernathy, who was Martin Luther King Jr.'s chief aide and closest associate during the 1950s and 60s, was born in Linden, Alabama. Happy birthday, Ralph David Abernathy. 1930, William Howard Taft was the first U.S. president to be buried in Arlington National Cemetery in Arlington, Virginia. Also our, also our fattest president. 1931, newspaper columnist and media entrepreneur Rupert Murdoch, founder of News Corp Limited, was born in Melbourne, Australia. A very unhappy birthday to you, you old relic, awful human being. Rupert Murdoch. 1941, the U.S. Congress passed the Land Lease Act. 1942, the Lend, sorry, the Lend Lease Act, which was helped to help England by lending. <laughs> Lending them military equipment. Okay, take that tank. Bring it back when you're done. Okay. During World War II, Allied forces in Southwest Pacific Theater came under the command of U.S. General Douglas MacArthur following his tour in the Bataan Peninsula in the Philippines. Of course, Douglas MacArthur was uh, infamously left all of his aircraft out uh, to be bombed after Pearl Harbor. He was in the Philippines. He commanded the Philippines and he just left all of his aircraft out on the tarmac to get bombed by the Japanese. And of course, they got destroyed and he had no air force and he had to evacuate. So, Douglas MacArthur, one of the world's biggest screw ups, basically became a hero somewhere along the line. 1959, Lorraine Hansberry, a, a raisin in the sun. Lorraine, let's do this again. In 1958, Lorraine Hansberry's A Raisin in the Sun became the first play an African American woman by an African American woman to reproduce on Broadway. Way back in 1959. 1985, Mikhail Gorbachev succeeded Konstantin Chernyanko as leader of the Soviet Union. 1990, following the vote in the parliament, Lithuania became the first Soviet Republic to declare, declare its independence from the USSR. And of course, they're looking over the border and all going, uh-oh, when is he going to invade? When is he going to invade? 2004, Madrid suffered a series of terrorist attacks when 10 bombs not detonated by Islamist militants exploded in four trains and three different rail stations, killing 191 people and injuring some 1,800 others. Bastards. 2006, Chilean politician Michel Bachelet became the first woman to serve as the country's president as she was sworn into office. We got a picture of her with a smirk on her face. So crazy. More world events this day. In 2020, the World Health Organization on this day declared COVID-19 outbreak as a pandemic. It took up all the way until March 11th. Probably should have been much earlier. Uh, featured event 2011 Japan was struck by earthquake and tsunami on this day in 2011 earthquake struck up the northeastern coast of Ansu Japan causing widespread damage to the country and triggering devastating tsunami that instigated a major nuclear incident yes that was a this day 13 years ago Feature biography, Dorothy Gish, American actress, film film star, silent film star, born March 11, 1898 in Massillon, Ohio, and died June 4, 1968 in Rapello, Italy at the age of 70. Other birthdays, Rupert Murdoch, we mentioned, Antonin Scalia, former United States Supreme Court Justice, born 1936. Douglas Adams, British author, born in 1952, and Didier Drog Drogba, Ivorian football player, born in 1978. Also, also the birthday of Anthony Davis, American basketball player, born in 1993, turns 31 today. And what day is it today? It is, we actually mentioned National Napping Day, National Johnny Appleseed Day. Yes, Johnny Appleseed was a real person, and he's actually a relative of ours. 
not too many people know okay. Johnny Appleseed was actually a real person. Yeah, he was a real person. He's actually related to us. Distant cousin. National Worship of Tools Day. Uh, if you worship your tools, get out there and start cleaning them. Get out there. Go on. <laughs> say a silent prayer or a noisy prayer or what kind of prayer you want to say to your tools. <laughs> National Oatmeal break. Nut Waffles Day. There's this very specific type of food, a oatmeal nut waffle. So I don't know if the oatmeal or the nuts make it better, but probably. It's National Promposol Day. Now, do you know what that is? No. Okay. I clicked on something and started music. It's National Funeral Director and Mortician Recognition Day. Now, if you're laying there and the mortician's working on you, you got a problem. <laughs> you're probably dead. So recognize them guys because their job, I guess they get paid quite well, so I don't know. And it's National 311 Day. I don't you know no what idea what 311 guess... is. I'll have to click on that too. Hmm. 311 Day offers an annual reminder that 311 is a resource for communities around the country to connect their duty with their city and not emergency services. The 311 system is not an emergency number to call in many cities across the country for residents to report issues, find out about city services, and ask questions. So don't call 911. Oh, you can call for, you 311 know, for graffiti. Road, or they'll park, call 311 fence for that damage, either. debris on the road, noise, resources. trees needing to be trimmed, and illegal parking. And national, you have any idea what national promposal day it is? Oh, it's promposal. That's what it is. Promposal. So it's the people are day. so heteronormative with promposal their. Promposal is short for, is what the long version of prom is. Yeah. I did not even know there was a long version no, of prom. No, it, it's prompo it's promposal. It's That's how you say it, not promposal. Proposal. So no, you definitely say promposal. Go to your prom. I don't know. Whatever happens at proms, I didn't go to mine. Promposal is literally whatever. it's just a proposal. I can't it's hear just you at proposal, all. Proposal, but you, instead you say proposal. I don't know if you're proposal. muting me or you're just muting the mic, but I can't hear I you. I don't know why you can't hear me. Maybe you muted me because I'm speaking. Oh, I guess I'll hear it later. I can't hear it now. Oh. Well, Anyways, oh. promposal is when you uh, okay. propose for prom. Some weird heteronormative I bullshit. I don't know. I had, my, I had my sound off. Sorry. That was me. Okay. I'm stupid. Prom promposal. Yeah. Promposal. Okay. Promposal. promposal. It's like proposal, but for prom. Because people are so like obsessed with getting married, I guess they have to do it for prom too. I don't know. I, I've never heard I've that never word done before it. in my life. I didn't go to prom ever. So neither did I. I had no interest in it. It just seemed like something all the kids I didn't like were it's doing. Too straight for me. <laughs> it's like I got better things to do. <laughs> I can I'm, milk cows and have. I'm too queer for it's that. Thank you. That's Goodbye. <laughs> Formal dating didn't really appeal to me. Yeah, it's, far, kinda, it's right? really gross. Um, and anyway. Yeah, it's like, oh, let's have a bunch of dumb stuff happen. As they say on I social think, media, what parents. are the straights doing? That's what they say. <laughs> what are the straights doing? I don't know. If prom is such, I mean, I'm sure the there's straight. like gay people and lesbians and all sorts of people who love prom, prom, prom but for me, it's a straight thing. It's like a weird heteronormative practice yeah i guess I, th I, I i i took it as just the thing the popular kids did I'm yeah like, yeah you know, heteronormative yeah. Uh, getting popular to me was never a thing it's like i'll be as popular as i need to be as soon as people like me i'll give them a reason not to like me. <laughs> let's test their friendship yeah okay all right that's it for today March 11th, 2024 on Before Coffee. Sorry for the mispronunciations and the technical difficulties. That was hilarious. I've never heard anyone say, because you asked me, do you know what that is? I'm like, no, I don't know what you're saying. <laughs> All right, this has been Allison here from the Netherlands, um, where also, we will be it. having our Good Twos News Day tomorrow. So get ready for some good news, not all bad news tomorrow. 
and here is your mic drop. Be sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notify buttons, and follow our other channels, Toxic Alley, History of Gravy, and Scratchy Old Records.